Number one, you're supposed to state the domain and the range. Then you're supposed to determine if that is a function by circling yes or no. The domain is the set of all the x values. In this problem, our x values are all zeros. So the domain is the set of zero. The range for this problem, as is most problems, every problem that you're going to see, is the set of the y values. Negative 2, 2, negative 3, and 3. Remember, in a set, the order doesn't matter. I prefer that you put the numbers in ascending order, but it doesn't matter. I didn't do that. Is this a function? Definitely not. As you can see here, when you put 0 in, you can get more than one answer out. Sometimes when you put in a 0, you get out a negative 2. Sometimes when you put in a 0, you get a positive 2, etc. For this particular relation, you get four different choices every time you put a 0 in. So, not a function. Number two, the symbol, the greatest integer not greater than x, means the greatest integer not greater than x. What that means is, if you put a number in for x, inside this, these brackets, and it's not an integer, you're supposed to round it down. So number two, we got f of pi. Pi, as we know, is 3.14 and change. 3 point anything is going to round down to 3, to the closest integer. Gives us 3 plus 6, which is 9. Number three, given that x is an integer, state the relation representing each of the following by listing a set of ordered pairs. Your answer has to be set notation, and you have to have ordered pairs in it. Then state whether the relation is a function. We can see right now that this is a function. This is a linear equation. It's a line. It has a y-intercept of 7 and a slope of 7. It's going to look something like this. Any non-vertical line is going to be a function. So we can say right now this is going to be a function. I'm going to get this a little bit bigger. So our domain here is going to be all the integers between 0 and 5. doesn't include them because there's no equal signs here. So it could be 1, 2, 3, and 4. So we're going to substitute into this equation one at a time each of these numbers, showing all of our work. So we've got y equals 7 times 1 plus 7. 7 times 1 is 7. 7 plus 7 is 14. It gives us the ordered pair 1, 14. So that's one of our ordered pairs in our answer. Then, let's put our 2 in. Two times seven is fourteen. Fourteen plus seven is twenty-one. Gives us the ordered pair two twenty-one. Third integer in our domain is a three. We got 7 times 3 plus 7, which is going to be 21 plus 7, which is 28. So we got 3, 28. Finally, we need to put the 4 in. That'll be 
28 plus 7, which of course is 35. and a set. Each ordered pair separated by a comma. Set notation. And we can see here that once again it is a function because every time you put in an x value you get the same y value every time. Number four Given that f of x equals the absolute value of the difference of x squared and 11 plus 5, find each value. So here we have f of negative square root of 7. It's the absolute value of negative square root of 7 squared minus 11 plus 5. One step at a time. That's how math is done. One step at a time. Order of operations, do what's in grouping symbols first. Absolute value is a grouping symbol. Within that, we have other grouping symbol. There's nothing to do inside this uh, set of parentheses. Do exponents next. Negative square root of 7 squared means you're multiplying that times itself. So a negative times a negative is a positive. Square root of 7 times a square root of 7 is 7. Seven minus eleven is negative four. Absolute value of negative four is positive four. Positive four and five is nine. Number five. Name all the values of x that are not in the domain of the given function. So we're trying to find the excluded values. Excluded values come from two locations. One location would be if you have a variable on the bottom of a denominator. Another comes if you have a variable inside an evened root radical. If that happens, that's what happens for this one, take your radicand set it less than zero. That means you're saying what's inside the radical is negative. If it's negative, the even root of a negative is imaginary. So we have x squared minus 25 is less than zero. What I've told you to do here is to solve the boundary. So you're pretending that it's an equal sign and solving it. Then we're going to use a number line to figure out what to do with our inequality symbol. Solving this we're going to get x squared is 25 which makes x plus or minus 5. That is not your answer. It just gets us one step closer. On a number line, a number line is technically a line with numbers on it might want to jot that down because that is pretty awesome. We're going to put each of these answers. Negative 5 and 5. Smaller answers go on the left, bigger go on the right. So it's in ascending order as you read it from left to right. We're focusing on this part right here. x squared minus 25 is less than 0. In other words, you're trying to focus on having 0 by itself, which is what we have in this step. Notice it says less than. So we're going to separate this number line using dashed separators, dashed vertical segments. Dashed means it does not include it. If it was solid, then that means it's including it. Pick a test point to the left between your two numbers and to the right. doesn't matter what number you pick. You take the test point and you plug it in to this yellow inequality. You don't really care what the actual number value is. You care if it's positive or negative. 
a negative 10 squared is 100, 100 minus 25, that's a positive number. 0 squared minus 25 is negative, 10 squared minus 25, that's also positive. It says here that we're looking for negative answers, that's when it's less than 0. So our negative answers is when it's between negative 5 and 5. I assume at this point I've explained to you what set notation is. So the set of all x's such that negative 5 is less than x, which is less than 5. Or you could also put an interval notation, and I assume I've shown you that as well, which is going from negative 5 to 5. This is not an ordered pair, that's interval notation. You can use either one of these, you do not need both. It's parentheses if it does not include the number. It's a bracket if it does include it. Number six, use a calculator to determine whether each equation is a function. Since this is plus or minus, you have to put this into your calculator twice. And you don't need to write this down um, to get credit. You might want to write this down if you don't understand. Into y1, you might put the positive version of this into y2, you might put the negative version. So graph is going to look like this. Hitting the x and y axis at the origin. Is that a function? Definitely not a function because it does not pass the vertical line test. If I were to take a vertical line and run it through this, I would hit it in more than one location. So, not a function. Number seven, write an inequality that describes the graph. We focus on the boundaries. We have two boundaries here. If I take a vertical line and hit these boundaries, whichever one hits the vertical line at the higher spot, we'll call that the upper boundary. The one that hits that vertical line at the lower spot is the lower boundary. So this here is the lower one. This is the upper boundary. So our answer, our y's, you can see that it's shaded below the upper boundary and above the lower one. So take your lower boundary first. Uh, you want to make sure that your equation solve for y. It doesn't have to be, but it's probably going to make it the least confusing for you if you do that. This is already solved for y. Take whatever y is equal to as the first part of your inequality. Use the less than symbol. It's less than or equal to because we have a solid boundary. Then you put your y, another less than or equal to, and then you put your upper boundary. There you go. Once again, lower, less than, y, less than, upper, depending if it's solid lines or dashed. If it's solid, you use equal to. If it's dashed, then you don't use equal to. Number eight, find the zero of the function. Zero is also known as a root. It's also known as an x-intercept. To find any of those things, which are all the same thing, Replace f of x with 0. f of x is the same thing as y. Get x by itself. If I had 6 to both sides, multiply both sides by 2, and divide both sides by 3, I get that my 0 of my function is 4.
Number nine. Given that f of x is 5 divided by the difference of x and 3, and g of x is x squared plus 5x, find each function. f plus g of x means f of x plus g of x. Which is equal to 5 over x minus 3 plus x squared plus 5x. Can't forget for any of these problems, if there's potential for excluded values, you have to find them. This one has potential, and actually it does have some, because there is a variable in the denominator. So at some point, we've got to find excluded values. To add these two things, we need common denominators. So I'm going to write the second function as a fraction. Then I'm going to multiply the numerator and denominator by x minus 3. Once you have common denominators, you can add these together. Our denominators are x minus 3. first part of my numerator is this 5 plus. This plus does not affect the signs after this. So I do not need to put the following in parentheses or brackets. If you want to, you can, but you don't have to. If this was subtraction, you would put this following product in parentheses or brackets. x squared times x is x cubed. x squared times a minus 3 is a minus 3x squared. 5x times x is plus 5x squared. Plus 5x times the subtract 3 is a subtract 15x. These two terms are like terms. So I can add those together. So I'm going to get x cubed plus 2x squared minus 15x plus 5. You are expected to write the terms in descending order with respect to the exponents. If you don't do that, I will not take points off, but I do expect you to do that. Then we want to see if this numerator factors. If it does, see if you can cancel from the top and the bottom. But before you do any canceling, you have to make sure you find excluded values. Our denominator, x minus 3, can equal 0, because if it does, you have excluded values. Pardon me. If it does, that's undefined. So what x can't be here is 3. This numerator is four terms factored by grouping. No matter how you group it, you will not be able to proceed after you group the terms together. You will not factor. Therefore, this problem is finished. We just have to say f plus g of x equals this. And we have to say x cannot be negative 3. So this whole mess right here is your answer. Number 10 same functions, this time we're multiplying. IMHO multiplying is the easiest thing to do. f times g of x means f of x times g of x, which means 5 times, pardon me, divided by x minus 3 times x squared plus 5x. It's got to be in parentheses. When multiplying, you multiply the numerators and you multiply the denominators. These yellow things are the numerators. These green things is the denominator. If there's no denominator, it means it's 1. Before you actually multiply, you might 
when I say might, I mean you really should do this. It doesn't always prove to be helpful, but you don't know it until you do it. You want to factor before you multiply those things out to see if anything cancels. x squared minus 5x has a GCF of x. The denominator is already factored. Does anything cancel? No. Some people think that this x and this x cancel because it's on the top and the bottom. It doesn't because the bottom x is not being multiplied times the whole bottom. It's x minus 3. So nothing cancels, which means it was pointless to factor this. So as we continue here, and multiply the numerator out because you don't want parentheses when you're simplifying. We're going to get 5x squared plus 25x divided by x minus 3. I need to move this over a little bit. This is f times g of x. Make sure you make this a closed dot. And x can't be, and make sure you find your excluded values. Our denominator never changed. It was always x minus 3. Denominator can't be 0, therefore x can't be 3. Eleven says find f of g. This is an open circle. That means that we're going to take function f, and instead of using x's, we're going to use g of x's. g of x is 8x. So now we're going to go up here into function f, and every time we see an x, we're going to replace that x in parentheses with an 8 minus x. So that's 8 minus x squared minus 8x minus 20. The color coding is for your viewing pleasure. 8 times x, quantity squared, means you square the 8 and the x. That's 64x squared. There are no like terms. That's the best we can do with this problem. Write the answer down at the bottom going to cheat a little bit because that's how I was raised. Number 12, determine if the given functions are inverses of each other. Circle yes or no. If these functions are inverses and you do a composition in both ways, f of f, um, pardon me, f of g of x and g of f of x, in both times you get the answer of x, they're inverses. If either one of those compositions does not give you x, then they're not inverses. So let's do f of g fog of x. Which of course is f of g of x. g of x um, before I substitute this in, it's generally easier if these functions don't have parentheses. I'm going to distribute the 2 in both of these like so. g of x is 2x plus 16. So in function f, we're going to replace the x with 2x plus 16. Distribute my 2, I'm going to get 4x plus 32 minus 16.
which is going to be 4x plus 16. That's what f of g of x is. That has to be x for these to be inverses. That's not. So they're not inverses. I don't have to check g of f of x. Theoretically, that could come out to be x, but it wouldn't matter because they both have to be. 13. Find the inverse of each function, then decide whether the inverse is a function. To find the inverse, replace f of x with y. Interchange your x's and y's. Get y by itself. I need to get rid of my times 4, so I'm going to divide each side by 4. To get y by itself, square root both sides. When you take the even root, you do plus or minus. So that is the inverse. Once y is by itself. Whoops. I've got some... Uh, wireless interference here, so sometimes it pauses. Is this a function? Certainly not. There's several reasons why it's not. All of those reasons are the same reason. Just depends on your perspective if it appears to be different reasons or not. This is plus or minus. It means if I put a number in here for x, as long as my answer to this radicand is not zero, so anything else, it could be one, two, three, four, five, whatever it is, it's the square root of that, and then it's a plus version and a negative version. So you get two answers every time you put a number in for x, except for when you get a zero. So it's not a function. Another reason, if you were to graph this, you would find that it looks like this. It doesn't pass the vertical line test. Fourteen. Use the distance formula, midpoint formula, and slope formula. That's what these directions say, even though they don't say that. Distance. Distance equals the square root of delta x squared plus delta y squared. Delta, recall, means subtract. My x values are 4 and 11. My y values are both a. By the way, if you ever become a teacher, don't use a's as your variables. They look like 9's. Notice my square root symbol didn't extend far enough. It has to go above the whole problem. So I need to go back up here and extend it. 4 minus 11 is negative 7. A minus, I messed up, I'm sorry. This right here should say A minus A, not A plus A. You were probably screaming at your computer a moment ago. You were screaming correctly. A minus A is zero. Negative seven squared is positive forty nine. Zero squared is zero. Forty nine plus zero is forty nine. The square root of forty nine is seven. So that's the distance. Slope. Slope is delta y over delta x. Subtract your y's over subtracting your x's. It's a minus a divided by 11 minus 4 or 4 minus 11. It doesn't matter. That's 0 over 7 or 0 over negative 7. 0 divided by 7 is 0. What kind of a line has a slope of zero? Horizontal. 
You don't have to write that down, but I'm just reminding you because it's important. Midpoint. Sum of your x values divided by 2 followed by the average of the y values. X values, once again, are 4 and 11. Y values are A and A. It's 15 over 2. 2A over 2. Don't use A's for variables. That is just ridiculous. It's going to give us the midpoint of 15 over 2, or if you prefer, 7.5 and A, because 2 divided by 2 cancels. Graph the compound inequality. Well, simply graph the boundary, and then shade accordingly. Let's take this first part here. Pretend that it's an equal sign. That's what the boundary is. y equals negative 2x minus 5. The y-intercept is negative 5. 0. I'm write this over here. 0 and negative 5. Slope is negative 2, so you go down 2 to the right one, or up 2 and to the left one looks something like this. This is y is greater than negative 2x minus 5. Or you could write y equals negative 2x minus 5 because that's what the boundary is. Need to find the x-intercept for that. The 0, if you will of y equals negative 2x minus 5. Put 0 in for y and get x by itself. And you get negative 5 over 2 or negative 2.5, whichever you prefer. So it crosses the x-axis. Also, well, we don't want to get too crazy right now, but we can't forget that this says, reading it with a y first, a y is greater than, not equal to. So this should be dashed. Let me graph the other boundary. y is less than 2x plus 4. It has a y-intercept of 4. also has a slope of negative 2. So it runs parallel to this other one. It's also dashed It's y-intercept, pardon me, it's x-intercept of its boundary. Put 0 in for y and get x by itself. And you're going to find out that that's 2. Now, these two graphs that we have, let me make sure you label each of those. This one here was y is less than negative 2x plus 4. It's bigger than this one and smaller than this one, so it's between them. Bigger than one and smaller than the other, so it should be shaded between. Number 16, 
I don't know how that got there. That is awkward. Write the slope-intercept form of the equation of the line through the point with the given coordinates and having the given slope. So this is the given point. This is the given slope. Make an equation. When you're done, put it in slope-intercept form. Since we have a point and we have a slope, the way I would do it, which I doesn't mean necessarily you have to do it this way, but you need to be thorough in your work if you use, choose a different method. Our y1 is negative 6, our slope is 9, our x sub 1 is negative 5. Do a little spring cleaning here with my sign, subtracting a negative is like adding a positive. If I distribute this 9, I'm going to get 9 plus 6 equals 9x plus 45. My goal, once again, is slope-intercept form. y equals mx plus b. If I, had, if I subtract 6 from both sides, I'm going to get y equals 9x plus 39. Seventeen. Write the equation in slope-intercept form of the equation of the line through the points with the given coordinates. It's the same thing as sixteen, only you have to do a step at the beginning. That step being you have to find the slope of these two points. So slope is delta y over delta x. y values are 9 and 1, x values are 3 and 7. It's going to be 8 over negative 4, which is negative 2. So we have a slope of negative 2, and we have two different points. You can use either one you want. I'm going to use this point, this slope. At this point, once again, it's the same as question 16. Do we just have different numbers? So I guess it's the same. It's not true. It's the same process. So we got y minus 1 equals the slope of negative 2 times the difference of x and 7. So y minus 1 equals negative 2x plus 14. So slope-intercept form is y equals negative 2x plus 15. Number 18. Collinear points lie on the same line. Find the value of 4k so that the points with each set of coordinates is collinear. I would strongly encourage you to label each point with a capital printed letter. That's how you name points. Then I would find the slope of the between the two points that does not have any variables. So let's say the slope of segment AB. It's the difference of y's over the difference of x's. Y values are 1 and negative 5. X values are 1 and also negative 5. Fixing your signs, making them more simple. We get 1 plus 5 on the top and the bottom, which is going to be 6 over 6, which makes the slope 1. The slope from A to B has to be the same slope between any two pair of points in this problem because we want to make them have the same slope. So next we find the slope of 
the point that has a variable in it and then any of the other points that we have. I'm going to use A because the numbers seem to be a little simpler. So we're going to find the slope of segment AC. It's delta Y over delta X. That slope from A to C needs to be the same as A to B. A to B is 1. So we're going to replace the slope of AC with 1. And on the right side, replace the variables y2 and y1 with numbers and x2 and x1 with numbers. It's going to give us a 1 equals 6 minus 6 divided by k minus 1. I multiply k minus 1 times both sides, add 1 to both sides, I get k is 7. Number 19. Determine whether the figure with the vertices with the given coordinates is a parallelogram. Circle yes or no. Lots of methods that you could use that would be appropriate. Whichever method you choose, the first thing you need to make sure is which are the sides of the parallelogram, which are the diagonals. So I'm going to call each of these points a letter. A, B, and C. A, B, C, and D, rather. I'm going to plot those points. It doesn't have to be perfect, but I need to have some type of guideline of where these points fall in the coordinate plane. A is 2, 3. B is 5, 4. C is 10, 9. D is 7, 8. So A, B, C, D, A. Um, not the scale. It looks like I just drew a triangle. Let me do a little bit better job here. If you do take the time to make it more to scale, it's, it's best, really. I don't have that kind of time, people. So that means A, B is a side, B, C is a side, C, D is a side, and A, D is a side. I'm going to use the method in which you find the midpoints of the diagonals. There's a theorem in geometry that says if the two diagonals of a quadrilateral bisect each other, it's a parallelogram. That means if they have the same midpoint. So we're going to find the midpoint of diagonal AC, and we're going to find the midpoint of diagonal BD. If we get the same ordered pair, it's a parallelogram. So we use midpoint formula. X values for A and C are 2 and 10. Y values are 3 and 9. I think I am writing just a tad too big. Two and ten is twelve. Three and nine is twelve. So I get six six. Now well, these numbers don't have to be the same. That's a coincidence. But whatever this pair of numbers are, it has to be the same pair of numbers for segment BD. Use the slope formula. Every time you use it, make sure you write down the formula. X values for B and D are 5 and 7. Y values for B and D are 4 and 8. Y 
Once again, I wrote a little bit too large. i got to shrink this down a bit so I have room to finish this. It's going to give me 12 over 2 and 12 over 2, which is also the ordered pair 6, 6. So this is a parallelogram because the diagonals have the same midpoints, which means they bisect each other. Twenty. Write the standard form. Standard form means positive a x plus b y equals c. A has to be positive. A, b, and c have to be integers. The term with the x and the term with the y have to be on the same side of the equation. Have to be. Write the standard form of the equation of a line that is parallel. Parallel means same slope. to the given line, this is our given line, and passes through the given point, this is our given point. So the first thing we do is take the line that we're given, find its slope. To find its slope, we have to get y by itself. So it's in slope-intercept form. Slope of this line is 3 fourths, coefficient of x. A parallel slope is going to be the same. So we did all that work just to get this slope. Take that slope in this point, point in a slope, put it in point slope form. From there we're going to manipulate the equation till we get it in slope intercept form. I'm sorry, till we get it in standard form. So we have y minus 0 equals the slope of 3 fourths times the difference of x and 6. Once again, I don't really care for having a fraction in my problem if I don't have to have it. So I'm going to multiply each term. There's three terms here. Each term I'm showing you is green by the denominator. So I'm going to multiply each term by 4. It's going to give us 4y, 4 times 0 is 0, equals this 4 and this 4 cancel because you're multiplying 3 by 4 and you're dividing 3 by 4. So I have 3 times the difference of x and 6. Distribute the 3 and I get 3x minus 18. Subtract 3x from both sides. This is not the answer because remember the the coefficient of x has to be positive. Multiply each term by negative 1 and you're going to get 3x minus 3y equals a positive 18. I do not need to write the positive. Twenty-one. Right, the standard form of the equation of the line that is perpendicular to the given line and passes through the given point. Everything's the same as 20, but it's perpendicular. Perpendicular slope means you're supposed to use the negative reciprocal. Negative recip. This slope is 3 sevenths. Its perpendicular slope is negative 7 thirds. Just like the last problem, once you have that slope, point slope form, plug your numbers in, I'm going to get rid of my denominator by multiplying all three of my terms by three. You can do that now, or you can do it later. Eventually, you're going to have to do it. It's going to give us 3y equals, I'm sorry, 3y minus 18 equals negative 7 times the difference of x and 5. These 3's cancel. Distribute the negative 7. Get your constants on the right, your terms with x's and y's on the left, 
We're going to add 7x to both sides. We're going to add 18 to both sides. This looks like it. an X a little bit. Let me erase that a little bit. Uh, add 18 to both sides. 18 plus 35 is 53. So standard form is 7X plus 3Y equals 53. Twenty-two. The radius is a bone in the human that connects the elbow and the wrist. A woman with a radius of 22 centimeters long should be about 160 centimeters tall. That was an ordered pair, by the way. A woman with a radius of 26 centimeters should be about 174 centimeters tall. That was another ordered pair. Write a linear equation relating the height y to the length of the radius x. So first thing we need to define our variables even though it tells us what those are. x equals the radius length y equals the height To write a linear equation, where you're going to put it in slope-intercept form or standard form, your choice. I'm going to put it in slope-intercept form. Is what I'm going to do. So I need some ordered pairs. We got 22 pairs with 160, 26 pairs with 174. These are all technically should be labeled in centimeters. So we need a slope. We're going to use point slope form. So, pardon me. Uh, we need to first find the slope. We're going to use the slope formula. Delta y over delta x. It's 174 minus 160. 26 minus 22 it's 14 over 4 which is 7 over 2 write a linear equation so y minus y sub 1 equals the slope times the difference of x and x sub 1. I'm going to use my yellow points up there. Now I'm going to use my I'm going to use my green points. So I got y minus 160. This is the green point I'm referring to. Equals the slope which is 7 over 2 times the difference of x and x sub 1 which is 22. Uh, I don't like this 2 once again. I'm just a little bit different than I did the last one though. If I distribute the 7 over 2 I get 7 halves x minus 7 halves times 22. I could do some cross canceling here. Divide the 2 and the 22 by 2 and get 11. It's going to give us y minus 160 equals 7 halves x minus 77. If I add 160 to both sides, I'm going to get y equals 7 halves x plus 83. Part B, about how long should the radius be? R radius is the x value. Radius is the x value. So this is x. 
I'm sorry. This is X. How long? Of a woman who is 157.5 centimeters tall. This is Y. So we take our equation and simply replace the Y with 157.5. Solve the equation for X. I'm going to get rid of this 2. I'm going to multiply each term by 2. And I don't have a calculator on me, so I'm not going to do that, even though I probably should be able to do that. I'm going to subtract 83 from both sides. It gives me 74.5 equals 7 over 2 x. I'm going to multiply both sides by 2. It's going to give me 149 equals 7 x, I believe. If I divide both sides by 7, I don't like to round in most cases. In word problems, though, I think it's important. So normally I'd write this as 149 over 7, but I'm going to actually divide it with a calculator, and it's about 21.3. Sentence answer. Her radius is about 21.3. Point three inches, pardon me, centimeters. Twenty-three. Population of Dallas-Fort Worth metro area was that number in 1970. Population grew to this number in 1990. If X represents the year and Y the population, find the rate of increase for the growth of the population. This problem is asking for the slope. That's it. Just the slope. So X is the year. Y is the population. So the question is, what's the rate of increase? Rate is slope, which is delta y over delta x. Ordered pairs, x is year, y is the population. One ordered pair is 1970, comma. I'm going to make this a big comma because my second number has commas in it. 2,352,000. Other ordered pair is 1990, Three million eight hundred eighty five thousand. So delta Y. It's the difference of three million eight hundred eighty five thousand and two million three hundred fifty two thousand. X values is a difference of nineteen ninety and nineteen seventy. It's going to be 1,533,000 divided by 20, which is 76,650. This is a rate. The Y values was the population. Population is talking about people. The X value was talking about the years, so this is people per divided by and per mean the same thing, per year. Sentence answer. The rate of increase is 76,650 people per year. Write that sentence out. The rate of increase is 76,650 people per year. That is the official answer. Last problem, I think. If ABC Corporation, it costs ABC Corporation, rather, $3,000 to produce 20 televisions and $5,000 to produce 60. Find a cost function. Let's let X equal the number of TVs. 
y equal the cost to produce them. I should have given you more room to do this. We've got ordered pairs once again. I'm going to put these up here. We got twenty, three thousand, and we got sixty, five thousand. Cost function. Well, just code for find the equation in slope intercept form. So we got the slope first of all. M equals delta Y over delta X. 5,000 minus 3,000. Sixty minus twenty. It's going to be two thousand divided by forty, which is fifty. Once again, Y is cost, X is TV. That means it's costing them fifty dollars to make each TV. That's what that means. Fifty dollars per TV. Fifty dollars per TV. Cost function. Point slope form. Y minus Y sub 1 equals the slope times the difference of X and X sub 1. Y sub 1 is 3,000. It can be either one of these points. I'm just using this first one. Slope is 50 x sub 1 is 20. So we got y minus 3,000 equals 50x minus 1,000. It's going to be y equals 50x plus 2,000. Supposed to be a cost function so instead of writing y, we're going to write c of x equals c for x. Function notation. Determine the fixed cost and variable cost. Fixed cost is almost always the y-intercept. Variable cost is almost always the slope. So the fixed cost, $2,000. Variable cost, $50. Sketch it. Y intercepts at 2000 Should label my axes. X is a number of TVs. Y is the cost. Slope is 50, so it's quite steep. Goes up 50 and to the right one, up 50 and to the right one. This is not to scale because it would be going much taller. I don't put any of my graph to the left of the Y axis or below the X axis because that means you're making negative TVs, you're making, it's costing you negative money, it makes no sense. That is it.